And we're looking to our stand-up for mental health show. Like I said, we have six comics coming up, so I want to give them a big round of applause. Six comics, yeah. And I uh, just wanted to uh, just tell you a few things before I bring up the comics. Uh, I, I uh, mentioned that I have a mental illness. I, I have depression. And, uh, you know, it's, it's funny how people react when you have depression, because they're always trying to cheer you up. I have, you know, I have people coming up to me, oh, you'll be a better person because of this. And I'm thinking, you know, that changes everything, because before I wanted to kill myself, now I just want to kill you. <laughs> and uh, we, uh, we recently, you know, just, just to give you a, a sense of, of how, uh, where we're at stigma-wise, so we recently had a mental health clinic put in, in our neighborhood where I live. And there was a huge residence outcry. They were like, we can't have this clinic. You know, these, these crazy people, these crazy people are going to come into our clinic, into our neighborhood, and do what? Art therapy? <laughs> I can just see them attacking pedestrians with macaroni and glue sticks. Stay in your homes. There's been an outbreak of collage. <laughs> and I was joking around with these anti-clinic people, you know, and they're like, oh, you think you're so funny, Mr. Stand-up comic. Sure, it all starts with finger painting, but pretty soon they'll be killing people with chainsaws. And I'm like, do you realize how much coordination it takes to use a chainsaw? <laughs> When I'm medicated, I can't even operate a Swiffer. <laughs> and it's hard to kill someone by mopping them to death. And, uh, you know, and what these people don't realize is that as people with mental illness, we are way more afraid of them than they are of us. I mean, put it this way. As people with mental illness, we commit 5% of all crime. That means normal people commit the other 95%. <laughs> Have you ever looked at a normal person? They're polite, they're well-dressed, they're gainfully employed. They could snap at any moment. <laughs> when it comes to crime, I feel way safe around some guy who hears voices and thinks he's the supreme ruler of the universe. Put it this way, when you are managing 50 billion galaxies, you are way too busy to steal my car. <laughs> You know, it's like, dude, I travel at light speed, why would I want your minivan? <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, I, uh, I take medication, and uh, actually my wife says, you know, she, because uh, medication has played an important role in my recovery. My wife said, you know, if I wasn't on my meds, she'd divorce me. <laughs> so I stopped taking my meds. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, some, some people really have the wrong idea about medication. I was at this uh, conference and this guy gets on stage, some expert is like, antidepressants, they're an addictive drug. And I'm like, oh really? Next you'll be telling me they're a gateway drug. They'll motivate me onto more powerful substances like tongues, <laughs> lifesavers, <laughs> preparation age. But I didn't mind being called an addict, but I mind being called stupid, okay? And with all the great street drugs out there, I would have to be an idiot to choose antidepressants as my high. <laughs> I mean, I get to see going to my dealer, and I'm like, yeah, I'm looking for something that takes four to six weeks to kick in. <laughs> yeah, I don't need to get high, I'll just settle for dry mouth and sexual side effects. <laughs> And stuff like that. Yeah, my therapist said that to get rid of my anger, I should go scream and yell and beat pillows. And I wouldn't be thrilled, neither would the other customers at Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> but so anyhow, we've got, we've got six comics, and I, I don't want to take a lot of time, so I just want to bring the comics up here. So I got a great few first comics. Looking at me. Maybe I should be going out in my underpants. 
<laughs> my first, the first time I was sick, I told my family how I was feeling, and they suggested that I go to the hospital. But is it really a suggestion where they take your home tag and stuff in the trunk of their car? <laughs> when they took me to the hospital, I thought I was normal compared to Charlie Sheen. <laughs> When I had my first episode, I thought I was a dog. Maybe that had something to do with the leech around my neck. <laughs> it was weird thinking I was a dog. Instead of, I, instead of going out for a coffee, I would wear down the alley and knock over people's garbage cans. <laughs> I heard voices for a long time. Then the radio turned on. <laughs> The voices would tell me to do bad things, but it's not a crime to leave the toilet seat up. <laughs> the voices also told me to do things that were very self-destructive, but I didn't want to eat at McDonald's. <laughs> the voices also told me that people were out to get me, so I stayed away from my ex-girlfriend. <laughs> At the hospital, they said I had to go into, into seclusion, but I refused. Then a bunch of security guards strapped me down and took me there. It felt like grasping, but the giveaway was when they got me in a half Nelson and smashed the chair over my head. <laughs> After I got out of the hospital, I felt like I wanted to give back what was given to me, but not many people want a chair smashed over their head. <laughs> When I went to therapy, it took three or four sessions before I started to talk. Because that's when they took the gang out of my mouth. <laughs> Since I've gotten out of the hospital, I had told my recovery story all over the country. In my talks, I tell people what I do to stay out of the hospital. Take my meds, eat right, and stay away from my ex-girlfriend. <laughs> Remember, it's not what you are, it's who you are. Thank you very much. It's all, folks.
to the godly one. <laughs> I used to be a phlebotomist. My job was to draw blood. They really didn't appreciate it in the grocery line of code. <laughs>
Oh, man. But uh, I also, uh, you know, I'm also really worried about the, uh, uh, you know, I, I mean, I'm trying to grow, you know, grow as a person. That's part of recovery and, you know, you know spiritual. So I went to psychic, and the psychic said, ooh, your house is possessed by evil spirits. And I'm like, no, it's possessed by Bank of America. <laughs> Thank you. Hi everyone and bienvenidos a todos. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I was pretty slow in school because of my disability and I got bullied a lot. And that was just by the teachers. <laughs> I have my car, and when I was a man, I'd drive to Florida. I didn't have a car, but I found a way around now. I'd go to a car lot, test drive a car. The only problem with that is I wouldn't bring it back. <laughs> as far as I was concerned, I wasn't stealing. I was finding a creative way to avoid the monthly payments. <laughs> and that's very true. <laughs> my real dad lived in Mississippi. He's a cocaine dealer who drives a cat. It was a weird combination. He's the only cab driver whose idea of a tip is a rolled up $20 bill. <laughs> he had an interesting business model. Put it this way, not a lot of dealers keep the, money, keep the meter running when they're making deliveries. <laughs> it took until I was 32 years old till I listened to a therapist. She said if I didn't get help, I would commit suicide or have someone kill me. I'd much rather kill someone else. <laughs> At one point, I was homeless and addicted to drugs. I overcame all that and had to learn basic life skills that so-called normal people use all the time. Like how to give your husband the silent treatment, <laughs> how to give other drivers the finger, <laughs> and what symptoms to fake so that your psychiatrist gives you the good drugs. <laughs> Once I was crossing the Mexico border with my two kids and I got busted. That was the last time I hid my stash and my kids in front of all my lunch box. <laughs> I would, when I was using my conversation was all about getting next to it. So I had no idea what to talk to other people about. What do you say to the next person sitting next to you at a dinner party? Can you, pack, pack, can you pass the pack pipe? <laughs> How much one ounce of marijuana? Get off my lap, you jerk. <laughs> but I've had some interesting jobs. At one point, I was a financial advisor for a college in Georgia. I talked my way into that job, but I really didn't have a clue about what I was doing. That made me pretty much like the rest of the staff there. <laughs> I didn't know how to file so I made my own filing system. It was called the garbage can. <laughs> that was true <tricky. laughs> I really changed over the years. In meetings, I was always the focus because I have something to say about everything. But my supervisor, Jim, taught me how to listen and not say a thing using a new technique. It's called duct tape. <laughs> Now I work in seven counties and I love working in mental health. I can do anything I want and people are okay with it. They draw the line when I run down the hall without my clothes on. <laughs> Even they're not that off their rocker. <laughs> I often have a hard time getting to sleep. I get most of my practice in staff meetings. <laughs> the great thing about working in mental health is that my clients also help me too. I take them home every Thursday to clean my house. <laughs> <laughs> I want to give a big thanks to Seven Counties for all you do for us and for giving me this opportunity. God bless. Dios te bendiga a todos. And have a good night.
I've heard people say stuff like, oh, you know, you'd have to be crazy to go naked bungee jumping. And I'm like, are you kidding? People with mental illness, we would never plunge head first into the ground with no clothes on. It's stupid people who do that. <laughs> stupid people are way more dangerous than we are. And put it this way, stupid people don't believe in global warming, so they buy these huge Hummers and SUVs. My mental illness makes me so paranoid of global warming, I'm afraid to let my cat fart in case it destroys the polar ice cap. <laughs> it's like, no, no, Fifi, you just melted Antarctica. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> Angel was talking about, you know, drugs, and I've, I've got kids, and I'm often worried about drugs and my kids. So I went to Dr. Phil's website, and you know if Dr. Phil gives you advice, it's got to be good advice. And on his website, Dr. Phil says, if you suspect your kid of doing drugs, you should strip search him, give him random drug tests, look at his wallet, his pockets, and his backpack, and develop an open and trusting relationship. <laughs> yeah, I found actually, because there are lots of programs to get kids to not do drugs. What works best in our family is social embarrassment. I just threatened to show up at my kid's parties wearing a Speedo and black dress shoes. <laughs> but uh, I told my son, I, 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 I grew up in the 70s, right? You know, things were kind of interesting in the 70s. Actually, uh, I, I did, I did um, LSD back then because it was, it was mandatory at the time. <laughs> <laughs> but those of you who grew up in the 70s don't know what I'm talking about. Um, actually, I was, I was looking at the mountains once, and I, uh, I saw I was on an LSD trip, and I was like, like I said, it's a problem, it's a good thing to do LSD, but I saw the trees jumping into the ocean, and I thought, this can't be happening. They're not wearing their bathing suits. <laughs> but they are wearing their trunks. <laughs> But anyhow, I've told my son a bit about the 70s. And, um, uh, you know, so we were walking down the street one day. He's like, Dad, if, if we were walking down the street in the 70s, would there be all sorts of strangers around doing drugs? And I'm like, no, son. It would be people you know, like me and your mom. <laughs> oh, gosh, yeah. Like I say, I mean, I'm, I'm not pro, uh, you know, I'm not pro drug. I, I can't drink, I don't, I don't drink. And, you know, people find out that I don't drink. Oh, good for you. That must take a lot of willpower. But the reason is I don't drink, I just don't like alcohol. And it's easy to not do something you hate. I mean, no one would say, oh, good for you. You don't beat yourself over the head with a frying pan. <laughs> that must take a lot of willpower. <laughs> but the reason I don't drink is that uh, in grade eight, in eighth grade, I got really drunk on my dad's really bad homemade wine. And that cured me forever. I think it should be part of every child's upbringing. <laughs> Son, you're in eighth grade. It's time to do the alcohol cure. <laughs> then we'll do the marijuana cure, the cigarette cure. And the kid's like, okay, Dad, when do we get to do the sex cure? <laughs> Dad's like, sorry, son. The only cure for that is marriage. <laughs> Here's me working the drive-thru at Burger King one night, 
late when I'm, when I'm really depressed. So some guy pulls up to the screen, dead silence, nothing. He's like, hey, aren't you gonna ask me what I want? And I'm on the mic and I'm like, Yeah, 
So, um, you know, it's interesting what, what we have to deal with, uh, you know, with, like this, you know, we talk about the prejudice and the stigma, and, and I think no wonder people are afraid of us. Every time someone with a mental illness commits a crime, it's always in the media. I'm a perpetrator who was mentally ill. I mean, if any other group got mentioned every time one of their people committed a crime, we'd be afraid of them too. And the perpetrator who was a certified plumber. <laughs> and you're the lady who's got into the sewage pump. <laughs> Send a hostage. The worst part was when he threatened us with his butt crack. <laughs> now I've got nightmares every time I open the fridge and see two grapefruits put together. <laughs> And a lot of organizations, they spend like hundreds of thousands on anti-stigma campaigns that portray people like myself with a mental illness as kind and compassionate and intelligent. But the general public, they don't give a crap about any of that. They just want to know that we're not going to hurt them. So if I was doing an anti-stigma commercial for TV, it would go like this. Hi folks, my name is David, and yes, I have a mental illness, but don't worry, I'm not going to hurt you. Not because I'm a good person, not because I care, because it's really hard to attack you when I'm too depressed to put on my underpants. <laughs> That's right, the worst violence you'll get from me is a passive-aggressive sigh and a guilt trip. <laughs> yes, you're safe around me, because thanks to my personality disorder, I am way too self-absorbed to even think that you exist. <laughs> but then I thought, maybe it's not that people are afraid of us, it's that they're not afraid enough. Because if they were so freaking terrified of us that they were always thinking about us, they would lobby government for more tax dollars so we would have more services and housing so we wouldn't become social problems. <laughs> so I think the anti-stigma commercial should go like this. Bob is freaking crazy. You may just see me working at your alley while the voices tell you to burn down your house. <laughs> There are 52 more of you within a three-block radius. <laughs> Isn't this worth raising your taxes? <laughs> or would you rather just pay more for fire insurance? <laughs> I mean, tell me now that message would get it across, I think. But uh, as I said, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm married. Who, who here is married? Or is I was, uh, I saw this store the other day and it had a, it was a cake store and it said, a cake for any occasion. And I thought, wouldn't it be great to have a cake for divorce, like a divorce cake? It would be black, heart-shaped with a knife stuck through it. <laughs> and you could get like poems written in icing, you know, like poems like, uh, roses are red, violets are blue, I was freaking crazy to get married to me. <laughs> How about violets are blue, roses are red, I really pity your new boyfriend, Fred. <laughs> or just some guy who's really angry and inarticulate, can't even rhyme. He's like, roses are red, violets are blue, hope you die soon. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, folks, we have, we have one last comment for you. And, uh, I mean, what, we couldn't do a show without her. Please give it up for Molly Cloud. <laughs> I had 
a whole new company with certification. <laughs> <laughs> my first psychiatrist said I would have to take medications for the rest of my life, that my symptoms would get more and more frequent, and then I'd get Alzheimer's. And that was good news. <laughs> When he told me that, I was so medicated and numb, I didn't even react. Which is good, because you have to be really drunk to deal with a psychiatrist like that. <laughs> Finally, the psychiatrist said that all I had to do was have a baby, and everything would be all right. I'm thinking, you mean I should get something that whines and cries all the time? <laughs> No thanks, I already have a husband. <laughs> During my first hospitalization, I did learn something. Crying creates the same endorphins as exercise. So now, to get the most out of my workouts, I get on the treadmill, listen to country music, and blow my eyes out. <laughs> I don't really remember much about my second hospitalization, except that I worked a bunch of puzzles. The biggest puzzle I worked was, how to get the heck out of there? <laughs> Once my husband took me to the hospital at 3 a.m., after he found me sitting on the dining room floor with about a pile of pills around me, the doctor said I was just acting out, that I should go to work and forget about it. I'm like, oh, why didn't I do that? Oh yeah, because it's a stupid idea. <laughs> I hate it when people say things like, you're so smart. You have a husband. You have a job. What do you have to be impressed about? Uh, the fact that I have to be around idiots like you. <laughs> Finally, I got into psychosocial rehabilitation program. In therapy, I learned on changing my self-image, and it paid off. Now I believe I'm 30 years old, have red hair, and weigh 108 pounds. <laughs> Speaking of red hair, I've always wanted to be a redhead. Once, when I was manic, I dyed my hair red, but nobody noticed. So I got it again, and again, and again. I kept sneaking out of the house to buy hair dye in the middle of the night. I dyed it until, well, it turned purple. <laughs> That's right. Some people binge on alcohol. I binge on L'Oreal. <laughs> Their commercial says, I use L'Oreal, and I'm working. When you dyed your hair five times in one night, you know you're really working. <laughs> By the fifth dye job, I had huge blisters all over my head. Let's just say it brought a whole new meaning to snap, crackle, pop. <laughs> Finally, my hair broke off, and my hairdresser had to shave my head. Everybody thought I was a cancer survivor, but they were very sympathetic. They let me get in front of them in line, helped carry my groceries out, and even gave me their parking spots. So now I shave my head once a week. 